a powerful plasma charge rustled through the thick white haze and struck the frontal armor of the portable pillbox that Gortigal had just set up in a small hollow. Oswaldo was thrown aside by the blast wave, right into a thicket of lush blue plants resembling a mixture of reeds and giant thornless cacti. The visor of his helmet was smeared with thick, sticky sap, and even as he rolled away from the mess, he could see nothing for a few moments. Gordigal. Silence. Only the static crackled. Oswaldo wiped his visor, making his glove both sticky and slippery. How was that even possible? And looked around carefully, trying not to stick his head too far out of the small groove into which he had clenched himself. The explosion had partially dispelled the smokescreen, and now the outline of the outpost was coming through clearly enough to be seen by eye. A typical Shandarian hexagonal battle platform, anchored with Cedonite drills into a basalt cliff. The Shandarians ceded disputed territories with such outposts as if they were planting some giant deadly mushrooms. Each platform carried five Shandarian stormtroopers, with personal weapons, of course, a couple of plasma cannons, and some lighter weapons that might vary. Oswaldo's group had already learned to crack these outposts like peanuts and cleared a couple dozen of them on the revenge plateau. But sometimes there were misfires, like now, for instance. Oswaldo didn't understand how the Shandarians had managed to spot Gortigal's pillbox. The whitish haze was not the ordinary thick smoke as it had been in the days of distant ancestors. It contained active nanoparticles that suppressed and scattered the signals of radars and active scanners. Of course, one couldn't rule out the possibility that the Shandarians had fired at random and hit. But what were the odds? The communications earpiece came to life. Guyan here, came a calm voice. We're all intact. The pillbox survived. Gore's a little dizzy, but I think he'll recover soon. Doc injected him with some serious anti-shock stuff for the Demetrians. How did those devils spot us? No idea, Oswaldo answered. But I think it was an accident. Otherwise, they'd have fried us by now. The smoke screen is blown away. It wasn't just the screen, said Nguyen. Jafar knocked out some of the sensors on the platform before it hit us. I think they're almost blind on one side now, but I don't think it'll last. They can turn it, you know. Copy that. We need to get moving. Have Gortigal stay here with the heavy railgun, but get him behind those cliffs at the back since the pillbox has been spotted. If they try to smash the pillbox, he's to try to catch the moment they lower the force shield for a shot and hit the center pod properly. You take Jafar and Doc Minich and go around the platform, direction three hours. There's a bunch of boulders to hide behind. I'll take the other side. We need to find a position above the Shandarians. Got it. Gore's almost recovered. We'll be moving in two minutes. Nguyen out. Oswaldo checked the charge counter on his pulse assault rifle. It appeared that he'd only fired a few shots since contact began. The previous platform had been cleaned out with little or no input from him. Hell, he'll have to persuade command to transfer Gordigal to his group permanently. The Demetrians may look like clumsy dinosaurs, but were excellent shock troopers, and they have a lot of stamina. Oswaldo was sure that if he had been in the pillbox at the moment of the hit, it would have taken more than a shot of stimulant to recover. He switched on his battlesuit's cloaking field and looked around carefully, mentally plotting his route. If he sprinted the twenty meters to that cleft over there, he'd be in the platform's dead zone. The Shandarians would have to hang over the edge to get a shot at him, which meant Gortigal would have a perfect target. Well, it's time to even the score. His boys scored the previous platform, so he'd have to push a little harder to be in the lead. The sensors of the cloaking field had already adapted to their surroundings. Oswaldo glanced at his hands, which clutched the assault rifle. They almost blended in with the blue-green vegetation in which he lay, as did the weapon itself. The cloaking field's effects had spread to it. Of course, it was only a visual disguise, and the scanners would see him as clear as day, but it was better than nothing. 
Oswaldo jumped out of the hollow and zigzagged to the chosen point. They managed to clear two more platforms, but then Minnick was caught in a trap net from a successful booby trap set by the Shandarians, and they had to request extraction. Jafar and Nguyen wasted no time cutting the net strands before it cut through the protective fabric of the battle suit. However, the suit had been damaged in some places during the assault on the last platform, and there was still a risk that the neurotoxins of the net could still get on the skin and enter Minnick's body. Of course, Gordigal did not miss the opportunity to joke about the flimsy humans. The big Demetrian, shrouded almost head to toe in natural horn armor, was virtually immune to the nets. There is no point in wasting nets on you, Jafar countered. Why wait for such a carcass on narrow paths when you can just shoot it with a cannon and not miss? Even by Demetrian standards, Gordigal was quite impressive, nearly two and a half meters tall and weighing roughly a third of a ton. Even the elite Shandarian special forces seemed frail in comparison. Good thing the Demetrians were our allies in this war, Oswaldo thought. Not that they had to face the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat so often, but he would certainly prefer to have a Demetrian in his ranks rather than as an opponent in a melee deathmatch. Frustrated by his failure, as he perceived it, Gordigal tackled the last platform almost single-handedly. While the others were searching for a way out of the minefield and rescuing Minnick, Gordigal jumped directly onto the platform from a nearby rock pillar from a height of 15 meters, crossing a chasm about 10 meters wide, and literally tore through the entire Shandarian crew before the rest of the group could make it to the scene of the fight. While they waited for the landing bot near the broken platform, Nguyen silently beckoned Oswaldo behind him and pointed to two stress-broken sedanite drill anchors visible from beneath the shriveled outpost. Oswaldo only shook his head. Well, such power comes in handy. But if he were to get Gordigal into his group, he'd have to do something about discipline. This was a combat unit, not a troop of traveling acrobats and power jugglers. Fifteen meters. He didn't know Demetrians could do that. How did he not break his legs? I'll have to check with regimental intelligence. What other secrets might the Allies be hiding? There was a low rumble, and Oswaldo was hit by a wave of hot air blowing dust and debris around the platform. A bluish glow flickered across the men's faces, and as if out of thin air, the massive silhouette of the dropship appeared above them, disabling the cloaking field. It was time to scram. As his subordinates ran up the landing ramp, Oswaldo took one last look at the jungle-covered revenge plateau now in its fourth month of fighting. If they succeeded in knocking out the Shandarians, it would only be a matter of time before the entire continent was liberated. Still, how did they spot them through the veil? Bliptar Kraxnor, commander of the left third spike of the second great wing of the Shandar, or speaking without ceremonies, the special forces of the forward operating army, watched as the dropship carrying the Terran soldiers moved away from the Plateau of Welfare. Despite all the tricks of these vile creatures, it was as plain as day on the screens of long-range scanners. This time, however, they brought this monster with them, their ally. Bliptar had already heard from other officers that these were truly serious adversaries. Another unpleasant surprise of the great advance First, these frail Terrans had put up unexpectedly stubborn resistance and even managed to stop the great advance in its tracks, and now these reptilian thugs. Indeed, the loss of the four power posts was worth the information gained. Intelligence worked well, accurately predicting the landing site of the Terrans and cramming the area with all sorts of tracking devices, the sacrifice of those who volunteered for these power posts will not be forgotten. Their names will forever be inscribed in the history of the Great Advance. 
Bliptar noted with pride the successful shot of the second power post, even though it had nearly derailed the entire operation. It was a miracle that the Demetrian thug was still alive. But how did they manage to hit the pillbox through the Terran's smokescreen? That damn invention still couldn't be overcome. When they used it, you were forced to shoot blind. Well, never mind that. They'd figure it out soon enough. Bliptar finally turned away from the screen and nodded to the destroyer's chief artillery officer. It was time to call it a day and return to base. The destroyer's main battery fired a salvo. The dropship tried to make a dodge at the last moment, but it was too late. Several antimatter capsules slammed into its side, and the Terran vessel became a cloud of flame. Bliptar noted with satisfaction that despite the long secret raid, which excluded fire contact with the enemy, his gunners had not lost their skills. At that moment, an alarm blared on the bridge. The Terrans have fired a hyperspace torpedo at us, shouted the watch officer, but no one had time to answer him. The torpedo, aimed precisely at the destroyer's main reactor, pierced the hull, and Bliptar Kraxner, commander of the left third spike of the second great wing of the Shendar, together with his subordinates, shared the fate of the Terrans he had just turned into dust. Magnificent. Simply magnificent. It is way more exciting than the usual game simulator or even licensed hunting. After all, the Committee on Involution has brought all the junior licensed species to an acceptably presentient state and chasing stinking savages with a spear is entertainment for the lower classes. Dear Leunaval, I am glad I took the risk of investing my modest means in your venture. Leunaval could hardly contain himself from letting his emotions come out. For great son's sake, invested my modest means. Mionsefjel's capital could be described by many words, and all of them were infinitely far from modest and one could not even speak of investment. Loaned at a predatory interest rate, that would be much more accurate. But nevertheless, Leunaval was pleased. If the tycoon liked his new project, there was no need to worry about the future. The bigwig would do anything to attract the most profitable customers, the money bags like himself, who were bored by all possible entertainment and looking for thrills for any money. This means that even with all the hellish credit rates, Leunavali himself will still have a pretty fat piece of the pie. I hope you realize that all this must be kept out of the press, he told the tycoon. My manipulations, hmm, have not yet been approved by the Senate and the Committee on Involution. Of course, my friend, of course, but tell me, won't we have trouble replenishing the, uh, consumables? Absolutely not. Leunaval was happy to answer this question, as this was the part he did best. You see, I rely solely on internal reserves, especially since all the species involved in the project have long since been brought up to the strict basic criteria of the Involution Committee. But you said that all rounds of the game invariably end with the destruction of the pieces, didn't you? Of course, otherwise we'd be taking a big risk but I have a trump card that no other purveyor of elite attractions has. I've extracted the mental templates from all the figures, and I replicate them anew before each round. That way, by the way, it's easier to implant them with thought receptors for customers. The copies aren't very stable, though, because the replication technique for the lower species hasn't been perfected yet. But we clean everything up at the end of every game anyway, so it's not a big deal. Leunavale smiled. I take it you enjoyed playing for the Shandarians? Oh, yes. Their idea of the great advance amused me quite a bit. Although there is something of the Committee for Involution about it. I hope you and I will play a few more matches. Of course we will. Of course I'll play with you, Leunavale thought grimly. If I don't, you'll just take everything away from me and sell me into slavery. He smiled dazzlingly at the rich man and wagged his finger with a sly squint. But don't cheat again. 
You're the one who saw my next move and pointed the plasma gun at the pillbox, aren't you? I barely got that lizard out of harm's way. The tycoon was embarrassed. Oh, sorry, my friend. I got a little carried away. I promise you next time, I'll play fair. Can we use the same templates for the game pieces? The dropship's ramp lowered silently onto the soft sand, and Nguyen's group quickly scattered across the terrain, taking their places according to their combat schedule. The dropship immediately sped off to the orbit. Nguyen signaled, and the group began moving between the strange, weathered limestone blocks and ugly, pot-bellied desert plants. If they succeeded in knocking the Shandarians out of the Desert of Curses, the continent's liberation would be a matter of the not-too-distant future. At this thought, Nguyen faltered. He felt as if he had experienced something like this many times before. A strong sense of deja vu overwhelmed him. But after a moment, it passed, and he began to look at his surroundings with renewed attention. Shandarian outpost platforms could be disguised as any of the cliffs, and booby traps were not to be discounted.